Welcome to the Mind Mill Podcast, where host Seth Marcus dissects and discusses all things impacting young adults. Peers, mentors, and professionals share intimate conversations on subjects such as entrepreneurship, exercise and health, music and art, the blessings and curses of technology, travel, and how to navigate adulthood in this age of information. We are the largest generation in history, and we dictate the future. The Mind Mill. Find your purpose, fuel your purpose. The Mind Mill booklet has arrived. This back pocket notebook is designed to be your catch-all for daily life. For many of us, note-taking is an absolute free-for-all. An idea strikes us, our friend recommends a good book, we remember that that bill is due tomorrow. What do we do? For most of my life, I was the quintessential random note-taker. I tried to jot things down on the back of receipts and keep notes on my phone. These habits left me disorganized and simply did not work. Without a system in place, we're doomed to continue scribbling on scraps, searching for random notes, and getting lost in our phones, letting our genius slowly slip away. It is for that exact reason that we created the MyMill booklet. It fits in your back pocket or purse and goes wherever you go. It's packed with templates and organization systems for productivity and clarity. Features in the booklet include dedicated areas for to-dos, categorized shopping lists, habit tracking, cash transactions, idea developments, AM and PM routines, and much, much more. This booklet is packed with useful and intuitive sections, easy navigation, inspiring art, and powerful quotes. While the MyMill booklet is incredibly easy to use, We've included a detailed instructive introduction to help guide beginners and experienced noters alike in maximizing their writing habits and overall productivity. The MindMill booklet is a game changer, consolidating your daily ideas and notes while limiting distraction, giving you much needed reprieve from your phone. Don't get us wrong, we aren't bashing technology. Tech is a wonderful tool and a crucial part of our society, but we see legions of distracted folks out there, and we're here to help the world reclaim their attention spans. The booklet provides tips on how to use it alongside your tech to maximize productivity and design for your most mindful life. With the MyMill booklet, there are no dings and alerts, just your thoughts ready to be captured and developed. So whether you're looking to optimize your productivity, build a writing practice, or just limit your screen time, the MyMill booklet is your best companion. Go to themymill.com for more information, tutorials, example pages, one hell of a podcast, and much more. Hello and welcome to the MyMill podcast. Today's episode is with Julie Penner, director of the famed Techstars Business Accelerator Program in Boulder, Colorado. She has worked with hundreds of diverse companies, challenging, empowering, exposing, and propelling them into new arenas of success. Despite the endless metrics and data points of analysis, Julie maintains that it's always human development that governs the success of a company. The Techstars Accelerator has expanded to over 100 global programs, but started here in Boulder. There are few people who have the collective knowledge and experience Julie possesses. Julie is one of those people who I immediately felt connected to. She has incredibly demanding schedules and responsibilities, yet I have never had an interaction with her where she has come off rushed, uninterested, or not present. This interview was much different than I expected. I had prepared a series of analytical questions surrounding startups, founders, and processes. While we touch on these subjects, the resounding theme of our conversation is on intentional self-growth and genuine connection. We discuss the emotional challenges that founders face, embracing humanity to propel teams, the power of self-reflection, and strength through vulnerability. We also touch on intentional ways to celebrate holidays, the Burning Man Festival, and the Danish lifestyle of Huga. Julie is a fantastic individual. I learn so much from her every time we speak. I'm proud to share this conversation with Julie Penner on the Mind Mill Podcast. Well, Julie Penner, Welcome to the Mind Mill Podcast. Thanks, Seth. Great to be here. It's great to see you. I, it's been a, uh, a long time in the making. I remember very distinctly when I was like, I want Julie to be on the show was when we spontaneously met at the Techstar Sustainability demo and we just were walking out early at the same time. Don't tell. <laughs> well, <laughs> the cat's out on that one. But uh, no, we were both had to get out of there. And I was like, you look so familiar. And we had met at a different event in Denver. And you offered to give me a, a ride back to my car when I was going to take a scooter. <laughs> so I really appreciate that. In retrospect, I've ridden a lot of scooters. Maybe that would have been more fun. But I, you know, I remember really enjoying our conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we just had this very quick powwow across Denver Metro. And I was like, awesome. Julie's great. And then that was totally strengthened when we shared New Year's Eve with that great group of people up mm-hmm. in Winter Park. And I was so floored by how intentional that New Year's Eve was. And you really had a big part in putting it together. So thank you for that. 
Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. It's great to have you as part of that. It seemed like you and our mutual friend, Amy Baglin, structured that. Was there uh, inspiration for why that happened or is that something that you do every year? I think New Year's, <laughs> I've had both really good ones and really terrible, probably more terrible ones than than really great ones. Sure. I think that's probably a shared experience, right? There can be expectations for that day that are hard to meet. Absolutely. It is a resetting of the clock. Each new year is a time to be reflective. I, I enjoy some introspection. And I think those triggers around introspection are helpful. Birthdays are another one. Sometimes they make us uncomfortable because not measuring up to some of the expectations that we might have for ourselves. But I think there's a power in New Year's around saying what you want, you know, really checking in with yourself around, here's where I'm at. Here's what I set out to do last year. What worked? What didn't? Mm -hmm. And then looking forward to the next year, what do I want? Do I want more of what I have? Do I want something different? Being intentional, right? I was reminded of this quote, actually, one of my founders was talking about it yesterday, but this one, it's sort of as always with me. The best day to plant a tree was 20 years ago. <laughs> and the second best day to plant a tree is today, Yeah. right? <laughs> so if you're going to make a change or if you want something different in your life, having the courage to realize that you're not planting the tree today and like you could, I think that's part of... Um, why I think that intentional setting around New Year's was so important to me. Yeah. I think it's very easy to be in a place of celebration and partying and be like, we're letting loose tonight. And tomorrow is, you know, from here on out, it's smooth sailing perfection. But what we did in Winter Park was, you know, a lot of very intentional and personal writing and reflecting on the year prior rather than talking necessarily about what our ultimate goals are for this upcoming year. And I think that is so much more powerful to really see the real change and the real benefits or costs of decisions you've made in a year yeah. rather than just looking for what perfection is, you know, and just yeah. resolving that the next day will be perfect, right? One of my mentors that has really impacted my life, his name is Zach Neese. He works for Techstars, but he has taught me a lot about learning and he's taught me a lot about for adults, we need time that is purposeful and set aside in order to learn, right? Kids are like learning machines. They walk around, they can't help themselves from learning. Adults need specific time for that. And that's been a, a skill that we have taught entrepreneurs, um, but it's also been powerful for me. So I think when you picked up on looking backwards, the retrospective part of what we did at New Year's, I think that's what you're seeing is my deep belief that learning needs intentional time and we sometimes skip over that, right? It's really easy mm -hmm. to just keep going, to think you've got the learnings, to rob yourself from the setting aside of time that really says, here's what I expected to have happen, or here's what I want to have happen, and here's what actually happened. That gap is where you really learn. And so thinking about a year, right? And I had written down things from the year prior, right? And then so I could bring those into my reflection about how that year went and see you know, what was a miss? What was a make? What did I learn? Mm -hmm. And carry that forward. That feels so much more powerful than just projecting forward without the context of what the last year has brought and what I've learned, how I've grown. Mm -hmm. There's another piece of what was really important to me, and, and this is my own personal, it's one of my growth edges, is being intentional about being grateful and appreciating the people who are in my life has been a skill that I've had to build intentionally. Some people are really good at it naturally. Yeah. I don't know if you know those people. Sure. Where, I don't know where they learned it, right? I'm, I'm a little jealous that they mm -hmm. are just very mindful of others and always remember to appreciate and thank people. I feel like I have to remember that it has to be a habit that I build. Yeah. And so moments of awareness, like the ones at New Year's where there were questions like, who's someone that you really appreciate for their contribution to your year? That was one question. The next question was, have you thanked them? That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. And it's in that moment of like, oh my God, I didn't thank the people who were really impactful to me this year. Or there was another question in there, who do you want to spend more time with? Or who do you want to get to know better in 2019 or this future year? And have you told them? I did that, right? Yeah. And it was such a powerful bonding moment with that person that it would have been so easy to skip over it. Mm -hmm. That's to me is intentional living. It gets me up in the morning. It also was very powerful because of the community that we were doing it with. We were in Winter Park. There were people skiing. There were people reflecting. There were people uh, relaxing and just staying warm. And then we had this very wonderful family dinner followed by 
two hours, maybe two and a half hours of writing, reflecting, discussing these answers um, and being vulnerable with each other. And it's something that I personally value my my writing practice. But that was one of the first times that I had really felt that I was in a uh, a circle of peers and, and we were all valuing the same thing very electively, right? This wasn't a, a work conference. Mm-hmm. We didn't sign up for it. Right. We just, this is what we decided to do um, on the last day of the year. And I think that really magnified the impact. I saw some of those people uh, just this last weekend and we reflected on it too and said that it's really, it really changed projection to not necessarily be in this, this is kind of based off of, you know, also the, the conference that we were all at the other day, but you know, it, it turned into less about these big ultimate goals and sales numbers and accomplishments and more about honoring a system that encourages success, happiness, and ultimately just um, disciplines mm-hmm. that encourage happiness. Yeah, it add learning and joy and appreciation to that list, right? Yeah. It wasn't an accident, in my opinion, that we did that kind of reflection work and held that space for each other to be vulnerable and, and really share about our, our years in a space that was also very playful, that was also very social, right? Um, I think there is a there is a potential fallacy out there that – you have to do it separately, right? It needs to be serious. Yeah. Um, and I just reject that, right? The fact that it is learning comes along with play, comes along with laughter and a, and a dinner that we cook together, mm-hmm. not an accident, right? right? I think those are all such opening um, events and um, kind of part of the process of getting to being really ready to be introspective. I think it's much harder to walk into Okay, I'm gonna sit down now and be introspective. <laughs> right. Right. Mm-hmm. It's just like a hard break to make from the rest of your chaotic or busy life to sit down and do that. And and actually, I, the year before I had an experience, I was invited to someone else's house who had kind of like a potluck lunch. Uh, it was all women, and there were about the same number of people, about a dozen people. But she, the host, created some space for us to just reflect on our year. And she had a whole workbook that was much longer than what we did. But I had a similar experience where I thought, wow, like there's something social here. There's something collective and supportive here. There's some playfulness here. Mm -hmm. And bringing that to a different group in a different format the next year felt right. And I think that's something I'll stick with hopefully going forward into more reflective times as they come. Totally. You know, on that day, you had introduced me to Yuga. Yeah, is that how you pronounce it? Huga, yeah. Huga, right. I think that that has a uh, a lot to do with why we did what we did on New Year's Eve. Would you mind expanding a little bit on how you discovered Huga and, and what it is? Because this, this is a new concept to me. Yeah. Obviously, the themes made a lot of sense, but I had never heard of this. Yeah, and, and I'll own straight up um, that I am not Danish, don't speak Danish, and probably don't have the right <laughs> Danish pronunciation. Um, H-Y-G-G-E. My sister-in-law, who speaks Norwegian, um, gave me a lesson, and but I don't think we say it right. Hygge is sort of the Danish art of coziness, and but that, or that's the best American or English translation for the concept. But I think it's much deeper culturally, more in the winter than in the summer, more with friends than alone. It per, kind of pervades their culture, right? It can be you can have Hygge lighting, you can have a Hygge cave or a krog when you go have like a reading nook, right? We might call it a reading nook in a house, but it's a Hugo Krog in Danish, right? And I found that concept actually when I was in Prague, picked up a book. It's uh, it's by the, the Institute of Happiness, I think is the book. And now it's becoming kind of more of a zeitgeist as people talk about Hugo and as I think something that American culture is really missing, right? This art of bringing kind of small groups of friends together, you see it in slow food cooking, like that's very Huga, you know, maker goods. Like I, I do pottery now. Um, so if you come to my house and I have a party, you're likely to drink out of a mug that I made rather than a mug that I bought. Okay. Right. That's very, that's Huga. That's it's very Huga. cozy, right? Okay. I think it's the interest in American culture, in my opinion, is, is a reflection of how we're missing this simple, connected cozy, comfortable time with people and really self-care for ourselves. If it's, if it's Huga 
kind of alone in your house, like a quiet, like you might light a candle instead of turning on a light or turn on the fireplace. Like fireplaces are very hygge. Mm -hmm. um, candles are very hygge. There's this crazy statistic about, I think that the Danes burn more candles per capita than like any other country in the world. <laughs> okay. right? Unscented candles, right? And that to me is a reflection of like what they value this simple time that we have, we skip right over. But we want it. We need it. We're kind of crappy at it. Right. We've lost our way. Yeah. Right? You know, these things came a lot more naturally before the technological revolution. Right. Yeah. Right? We're super connected. Mm -hmm. Just this weekend, I spent two nights off-site up, up in a mountain house with, a, we do a founder retreat. Uh, we take about 20 founders up in the woods. And on Friday night, so it was two nights, Friday, Saturday night. On Friday night, the internet went down. Oh, boy. And, you know, for a bunch of tech founders, it <laughs> <Yep>. was like <laughs> a panic, panic moment. And then once they settled in, it was such a benefit. Yeah. You know, nobody was on their phones. Nobody was on their computers. And so easily reminded of how how much we are wired to connect yeah. when we don't have something taking us away or distracting us. Mm -hmm. And I think Huga is akin to that, right? If you make yeah. a space that is designed for that slowed down, relaxed space, it is also a place to connect with others more deeply than than we do when we we're kind of running around with our phones. Yeah, it is so powerful. I, I wasn't completely disconnected, but when I went traveling last year, I made it a very big point that I was going to only have kind of like office hours of connectivity. Mm. No phone plans. I wasn't searching for Wi-Fi while I was jumping around cities mm. and things like that. You know, it was very much like my phone was for audible and for taking occasional photos, Yeah, right? It really encouraged so much connection with other travelers, with the locals. And you realize these things, especially when you set intentional time to do that. Because at, at this point, it really, it, you know, it just goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Like if you don't set time and intention to do this, to connect, it mm -hmm. slips through your fingers because mm -hmm. there's so much demand on really anybody in in this yeah. day and age, but especially um, people in your line of work and the people and the founders and the people that you work with, you know, there's just this never ending demand on your time and on your attention. You know, there's always more to be done. Oh, and yeah. so it can seem so fruitless to, you know, light a candle or to make a cup or to, or to connect. And yet we consistently feel more disconnected. Although all the metrics show how we've never been more connected, right? You know, like I, I've got this much connectivity with everybody. I can see it on my phone right now, but yet I feel hollow, right? Isn't that a powerful dichotomy? I mean, I think that is the tension that that our generation is going to have to figure out for our own well-being. Yeah. We're either going to figure it out or we're not. Well, I think it's coming. You know, I, yeah. I think that we're in a very fortunate position to be in this area of the country and to have this awareness. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that it's not the beginning of something and that you know the people listening to this they feel that same feeling like why do i listening to this on 2x in their car while driving you know <laughs> yeah right while skimming emails and and seeing their uh, you know in the background while they're fast forwarding right. through youtube mm -hmm. yeah, I, yeah that's I how most you. that's how most people listen to the yeah. mind <laughs> um i think that there's these this resurgence of the appreciation of you know what i guess we can we'll call it yuga for from now on, or I mean, it, it seems to be very in line with mindfulness practices mm -hmm. of really just being intentional and present in what you're doing and spending time to be to focus on what is happiness, what is true connectivity, you know, diving deep with one rather than skimming the surface with thousands. Totally. Right? I think we're also finding a greater appreciation for places that don't allow our phones. Right? I can think mm -hmm. of two more that came up other than, than the retreat. We, we also make clean agreements around no phones. Um, in our conscious leadership groups that we do, right? No phones except to keep time and they're always on disabled. Yeah. Um, and then the other one actually is, yeah, I've been to Burning Man a couple of years and it's it's really funny to watch the connectivity which starts out okay and then as more people arrive, right? The 70,000 people who come totally overwhelm the cell tower and you basically have no connectivity. Um, and then it kind of comes back up on the other end as people start to leave. Yeah. Um, but... It, those are both places that I treasure. And I don't think the two are unrelated because the emphasis is really around connecting with people. 
Yeah. It's funny. Like we've already brought up a few and I know I've talked about it before on the podcast, but for me, my strongest experience with the, you know, connectivity through disconnectivity philosophy was in the the nightclubs of Berlin mm. where they put stickers, some places they would just take your phone and you check it with like your coat, you know? Um, and it was, uh, you know, it wasn't like you weren't worried about getting stolen. This was like the staff and, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people are doing the same thing, but, um, or they would put stickers over the front and back cameras. It's such an exclusive club experience sort of thing where like, you know, if, if you're seen just like on your phone, like that's not a good vibe and you will get booted out, right? Yeah. And especially if you're taking How photos. How powerful. A lot of it is for their own kind of selfish capitalist reasons where they want to create like a scarcity, like very, uh, a wild event. This is a very special place that you, you know, they don't want to just necessarily show all over the internet. You know, you have to get in to see it and to experience it. And I understand that too. But you know, the flip side is that nobody has that on them. So everybody is like, well, you can either have a bad time or you could get out there and be a part of this. Yeah. I don't even like dance music. Be right? a human. You know, like Again, I was, I wasn't remember, even, yeah. remember what it was like. Like mm -hmm. I, you know, we're from a generation I had my first cell phone when I was in college. Yeah. I grew up without that connectedness. And I think that will, will be the last generation that ever feels that way. Remember, in the same way kid, where it was just, right? there wasn't even an option. Right. Right. You know, I yeah. think that what we're talking about is there's hopefully a resurgence, especially in the parenting community and, and to the, the next generation of kids to encourage genuine connection, to strengthen those muscles. Otherwise, you know, you're just consistently feeding the technological connection, yep. you know, the iPads all day and, mm -hmm. you know, um, just the extinction of boredom. Boredom is always bad and boredom should never be explored, right? And, you know, I, as a kid, it was like the boredom was where you figured out what you were into, right? It was like, yeah. well, this is how I make a new friend. This is how I learn to ride a bike. This is how I get into trouble. You know, you learn your barriers, you know, you learn what Or have that great, great idea, right? That, mm -hmm. that mental quietness that right. gives you time to think of something creative. Yeah start getting into building something in your yeah. garage or, you know, and you start to find your passions, yep. you know, and it comes out of the curiosity spawned from boredom. And now, you know, now it's very difficult to have the discipline, especially as a child, you know, it's like, well, do, do I want to watch another awesome cartoon? <laughs> like, <laughs> cause I have 10,000 of them on Netflix right now I could pick from, or, <laughs> you know, I just had a story come up for me around envisioning the future where people pay money to walk into a completely white walled room with 12 other people that they don't know yeah. and like shut the door almost like an escape room, but there's absolutely nothing in it. Yeah, it's called a boredom room. <laughs> boredom. <laughs> and it's like we sell it by the hour. Yeah. And you can pay 20 bucks to you know. be in this room. <laughs> I bet I bet I bet you could probably get Silicon Valley about it and make it and just have million dollar business. I think that's amazing. Just, like creating boredom rooms Somebody's around, gonna do it. <laughs> around San Francisco. It's gonna Francisco. look a lot like this. <laughs> I like it. And that's a free idea for anybody out there who's, there who's looking Take for something run. to build. Yeah. You had touched on Burning Man a couple of times mm -hmm. since we started talking. I have never been, although from talking to a lot of my friends and peers, they are almost surprised that I'm not a regular goer because of the things I talk about on the show and my passion for traveling and things like that. You are a, a pretty seasoned burner at this point, are you not? Uh, yeah, you know, I seasoned burner, I think of like the 65 year old couple who's been going <laughs> for like 20 years or. Sure. It's um, all relative, right? You know, and they say, they, I, you know, a seasoned burner for me is someone who was there before the LED infusion. Sure. Um, so I'm somewhere in the middle. Of that, right? Not new. This will be my fourth burn in August, and we're already kind of planning for that um, excursion as a as a camp. And uh, so I'm somewhere in the middle. I feel like I've now hosted others that are new to the experience, and yet have like respect for those stories of people who have been there a lot longer and seen other things and yeah. experienced so many different kinds of people and so much art. And it's a cool community, and I'm glad I'm a part of it. I think it's the strongest ally to what we're talking about about connection through curiosity and not through technology and obviously it, it has an incredible social media presence you know everybody mm -hmm. knows mm -hmm. about burning man mm -hmm. but then you get there and you're completely blown away yeah um well, the, it's it's such a radically different experience between the stories about burning man and embodied experience of burning man mm -hmm. and i think that's what that's why people can poke fun at it Right. Mm -hmm. Because, oh, you can't understand. You can't understand, man. It was like that cool. Right. Uh, that there's something real there, which is I had, you know, a set of experiences that were emotional 
and psychological and thoughtful and I experienced them in person in a relatively extreme environment. And no, without having a similar embodied experience, you won't understand. So I think that's also part of the draw, part of the mystique. And I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. That's fine with me. And it's it's also fine to poke fun at, right? There's nothing like the irreverence of Burning Man about Burning Man (laughs) to sort of make the whole thing circular. Sure. Feel free to poke fun at it, right? Like (laughs) Burning Man is a place where that kind of irreverent humor is very welcome. Mm -hmm. What interests me the most about Burning Man is that it attracts such a diverse amount of people. Um, You know, when you, I think that the term burner is like, you know, calling somebody a hippie or, you know, or even, you know, having like some sort of like political alliance, you know, it's like, it's such a broad term for a complete individual mm-hmm. right and and so to be to be a burner means that you could be a tech founder you know a, a tech stars graduate or something like that that's going for a certain set of reasons or the complete opposite you know a vagabonding artist that mm-hmm. is there for a completely different set of reasons and yet the connection there you, you know these two people can meet and form a lifetime friendship through these experiences in a lot of ways the challenges Mm -hmm. of burning man i Mm -hmm. i think i may have talked a little bit about this over new year's eve about how connections are formed such such a stronger bond when there's challenges involved yeah when people share an experience that involves them outside of their comfort zone you know that's why traveling you meet people and you have such a great connection with them because you know you're both out there don't know yeah don't know where you are and you don't know your surroundings it's time to yeah. i designed that experience for the founders that are that yeah. are with me for 13 weeks and mm-hmm. we don't make it hard just for that the sake of it being difficult yeah but we do feel like because it's hard it does bring them together more and that's a good thing so i'm on the same page I know a few different people who have gone through Techstars, but I don't know. I obviously haven't been in the program itself. Would you mind discussing just a little bit to the people who don't sure. know yeah. anything about Techstars, wh- where it started and where it's heading? Yeah, where it's heading is pretty big, and um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk more about I'll talk more about my experience kind of at yeah. Techstars. So I feel very lucky. I've been at Techstars for the last five years here in Boulder. Techstars started in Boulder in two thousand seven. And I've had something on the order of 1,800 technology startups go through a Techstars program. There are now, I think, 47 of them around the world. So it's very much like a network for entrepreneurs to connect with each other and help them succeed. And the Boulder program is sort of where it all started. So there's some magic there for me, right? There's a legacy there for me. It's a 13-week program. We take 10 companies, get them great mentors. We coach them on things that we think are the most important things for them to pay attention to as early stage tech companies. And we've had some success along those lines over the last 13 years, 12 12 or 13 years. It's the 13th program in Boulder. So I am on a staff that puts that program together once a year. And you know, I have a few lines about it that feel really true. One of them is I pick my 30 new best friends every year because I'm choosing along with the other program staff, the 10 companies that are going to be part of our program for those 13 weeks. And you know, spending this weekend, like I just got done doing, with these 30 founders in the woods, talking about feelings, talking about co-founder issues, mm-hmm. and watching that class really come together as a group is so enlivening to me. And watching them be on this journey beyond you know, our time together, our 13 weeks together, we help them, you know, pass the program. Of course, we're investors. We want them to succeed. We have a, both a vested interest and, a, and a, just like a personal interest in them. But these 13 weeks feel really special. And special for us because it's, for me, it's time in with those founders, right? It's, they are my main focus. Um, even kind of friends in my social circle sort of take a back seat during this time. I really focus on these founders for them, it's a special time in their company. So it's a time when a ton of resources are at their disposal. I call it a buffet yeah. you know, or a fire hose, right? Mm-hmm. How much do you want to eat from the buffet? Because we will keep feeding it to you as much as you can handle. Right. It's a very capacity-defining experience for everyone. Sure. I like living at that 
pace. And then I need rest and relaxation afterwards and mm-hmm. kind of repeat the cycle. So mm. how often are the programs? Just once a year. Once a year in Boulder? Yeah. But there's also some like offshoots too in this area alone, right? I mean, the, oh, yeah, just, yeah. the sustainability program. Right. I went to the original Tech Stars demo days to see Meet Mindful present. Right. But um, yeah, and then this last fall for the sustainability program. Are there differences between these programs? Or it seems like the emotional endurance is one of the most stressed themes in the tech stars program because i think above all else you have to be able to to cut <laughs> up it. with what's going to happen <laughs> yeah right they're right the, the emotional roller coaster of being an entrepreneur right mm-hmm. i've never seen a successful company that ha- didn't have massive ups and downs and being able to not just persevere but thrive and have resiliency through those ups and downs is for sure part of the game there are 47 tech stars programs around the world there are some things that are common to all of them, like they are all mentorship driven. They all plug into our network. They all have partners, global partners that they help them, you know, accelerate their business, a bunch of other things. They also are all unique. So it's a different way to have a scalable entrepreneurial network, right? And a lot of them are, at least in part, a reflection of the people running them, the kind of pro- individual program staff. Mm-hmm. So me and the person I run Techstars Boulder with, his name is Natty Zola, he and I have a philosophy around investing in coaching companies that is reflected in the companies we choose and the way that we coach them and the resources that we give them that is also unique to us on top of the, you know, what is a standard Techstars program. And every program does that. They just, it's a reflection or an amplification of what's important to us. Right. Just like the companies that are in the program. Right. So for us, one of the phrases that really resonates is building great companies from the inside out. That means something pretty particular to us. And what it means in particular is that you as the founder, right? You're the, say you're the CEO you're, or you're another co-founder, right? Your values, your strengths, your shadows, your background, your context will be amplified throughout your company, first through your leadership team that you bring on and ultimately throughout the entire company. Which means, if that's true, right? So that's that's a, an assumption that we're making. Because mm-hmm. we've seen it. We've seen it play yeah. out. If that's true, that means work on you as a founder will also amplify out to your entire company. So if I can add to your self-awareness, or if I can add to your social competency, or if I can add to your awareness around others, whatever I can add to in terms of your skill set as a leader, whatever I can bring to your awareness that changes how you are as a leader or makes it so that you can get the best out of everyone around you or build a place of work where everyone can succeed, not just the people who are like you. Right. I think we build a better company. That's something that Natty and I believe deeply. And I don't think you'd necessarily get people who would argue with that, but there's a difference between believing that that's true and operationalizing content and an experience that does the work right. of doing that. Mm-hmm. And that's what I think is really unique about what we're doing in Boulder. It's part of why I've been there for five years and continue to learn and grow and be inspired by those transformational processes that take place in the program at the personal level. In addition to the company work and making progress and accelerating the company, we're accelerating people. The people that we're accelerating, these founders, have influence in the world. They're building these companies. They're funded. They're role models in a lot of different ways, not just the companies they're building, but also in their communities. So to me, it's leveraged impact. That's just hugely inspiring. Yeah. Me. Yeah. And it's inspiring every time I talk to someone who's been in the program or seen a demo day, you know, the fire of life is in these people and they're coming out of these programs and it's really inspiring. Do you have any suggestions for younger entrepreneurs or companies that may know about Techstars and are like, well, how do I get to Techstars, right? Yeah. You know, we say you can't go wrong by building a great company. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, It's also a network. I've seen people who just keep showing up, just keep learning, get involved. I think those are all key ways to become better, build a better company. If you're a young entrepreneur, here's the dichotomy that you have to deal with, or here's the point of tension that you're going to run into. How do I learn from the experiences of others who've hit roadblocks that I'm going to hit or had challenges that are going to be like the challenges that I have? 
How do I take the most from their experience, but also acknowledge that I have a different business at a different time in, in the world with you know a different worldview? The world has changed since those experiences happened, and this is a different business. How do I hold those two together? And I think that can be really hard for young entrepreneurs who can go to extremes. Either they get seesawed or spun around whatever mentor they talk to next and how they see the world, or they just tune it all out and they say, oh, they don't know my business. Right. right? Mm. And neither one of those are really helpful. Right. Somewhere in the middle where you say, I have a North Star or a true, a core belief. And this is what, by the way, I'll have, I have a question to get to it, right? I have a core belief that's guiding me. And that's something, you know, I can, I can question it from time to time. I'm not going to let other people question it. I have this core belief that I'm going to make progress along. And then I'm going to let data come in. And I'm just going to take all the stories and advice that say, you should blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's data. I can choose to do what I want with it, right? And if I get opposing data, hmm, that's interesting. Rather than saying, oh, I'm getting whiplashed by my mentors, right? That's a common complaint, right? Is to say, okay, well, I'm getting opposing data, which means I don't think anybody really knows. Right. You probably have to experiment on it, mm -hmm. right? I think that confidence as an entrepreneur to know the difference between data and what you know is true or the assumption you're making that's different from anybody else in the market, what you believe to be true and holding the two together, that's a skill. It is. Yeah. And as you say it, I can't help but be a little introspective and being like, what, what, what am I, what am I, <laughs> what am I believing? What, what should I be rethinking? You know, it, it's yeah. just, uh, just the introduction to those ideas um, on such a large level, like a tech stars program is already edging my comfort zone. A bit. Mm, awesome. <laughs> you know what I mean? It sometimes happens, right? Where you talk to mentors and you'll talk to 10 mentors and they all tell you the same thing. The other trap is not listening to that, right? Because mm -hmm. then, then like the data is overwhelming. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think it becomes much harder to totally ignore the data. I think they know something about the market that if you really believe the opposite is true, you better go find a lot of evidence. Yeah. And I'm not saying that they are right, right? Notice I'm still not convinced that it's not a different time, a different place. You have a different yeah. business that you could be right and everybody around you could be wrong. That's totally possible. I'm just saying now the need for, to build evidence that you're right and they're right. wrong is absolutely the most important thing to de-risk. <laughs> the pitfall on one side of the equation is if you follow all the conventional wisdom and you follow the data, then you just become another company that doesn't have any unique marketability. Right. Yeah, right. You're completely you know? different. Right. You're just, you're, just an, you're just another competitor. You're just kind of like kind of scrapping for the same market share and it's you're fighting an uphill battle. Right. You right? look like you, everyone else. Exactly. But then on the other side of it is you could be so obscure that you never find your core market. You never actually prove your concept and make this company legitimate. Or you you're have a fatal flaw in your go-to-market plan and you refuse mm. to hear it. Yeah. I remember, I'll tell a quick story. The first startup I worked for was back in Boston it was a company that eventually was called Zio. It was a sleep headband that you wore at night, and it gave you a very detailed readout of how you slept. You docked it in the morning. This was before iPhones. We were doing consumer hardware in 2003. <laughs> it was pretty ambitious. And we were all college students, right? I think the oldest of us were, was 23. We had no idea what we were doing in lots of ways, um, but we're really pushing the edge of what we could create. And... Everybody, when they saw the product, thought, cool, um, can you put it on your wrist or something, right? It was consistent feedback. Nobody wants to wear it on your head. And our pushback was, we had a good reason for that pushback, right? Which is, well, your wrist doesn't sleep the same way that your brain does. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, wearing something on your wrist doesn't give you the same data as it does on your head. So, no. And then we watched things like Fitbit eventually tracking some other things, but the most resistance we encountered consistently for years was around wearing it on your head. And I have wonderings about what might have been different. And the company did raise a significant amount of money, went to market. I'm really proud of what the team built and created and pushed the boundary for kind of how consumers can know more about their sleep. But ultimately, people don't want to wear a headband. And I wonder if we had accepted that input that data that was so consistent from the early, early days, if we wouldn't have been something different. Mm. 
if you would have been a Fitbit competitor at the very beginning. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. The story is kind of mirrored with uh, the Google Glass campaign, right? You wear like a set of glasses and it mm -hmm. has a screen up in the corner. It was very avant-garde in this new technology, the mm -hmm. future of wearable tech, and it failed miserably, you know, and that was one of the biggest companies on the planet. Right. You know? It's fascinating, you know, and it can definitely be maddening too, you know, oh, yeah. finding that balance. And it's so uh, representative of our lives too, you know, is this, this balance between your own North Star and, and not being too rigid in your ways to not listen to to feedback and yeah. to, you know, people who, especially, especially when people are coming from a place of truth and love, you know, and not necessarily just spewing their own bullshit on you, right? You know, they, they're having a bad day, so they're telling you what you're, all the things you're doing that's not right. It's something that comes up a lot on the show of, you know, like the doctrine versus spontaneity and where to find your balance. Yeah. It's just, it's just different for every person. It and is. the seeking of, you know, finding the mentor that's going to tell you all the right things, it just it truly doesn't exist because nope. it, it'll always be a mixture, a concoction of what you've picked up, your own experiences and your own core beliefs. Totally. You know, one of the topics that came up for us this weekend that really blew me away how much energy there was around it was giving and receiving feedback. So it kind of ties to, to what we're talking about. You're getting feedback from mentors, but just what does it mean for you to really be open to feedback can be a very challenging question. And we talked a little bit about situations where someone says with their words that they're open to feedback, but their body language and their tone makes you think that they aren't. How do you deal with situations like that? Or how do you really... This is coming from the perspective of the person giving the feedback? Yeah, right. right? Mm -hmm. And we had some of our coaches. We do a lot of coaching in our program. We think coaches can be an incredibly powerful mirror for what an outsider who's not attached to your business can see that you might not be aware of, right? Going back to awareness. And we got a couple coaches say, oh, you say you're open to feedback, but I don't believe you, right? And that's really powerful. If you can take that in. Right. And say, whoa, how am I showing up in a way where like, but I, but I said I was open to feedback. In a corner with that, right? You know, <laughs> right? it's like, I don't think you can take feedback very well. And they're like, well, where do I, where, how do where I, do I go with that? Right. right, right? Yeah. Well, I think it's, the, I don't believe you comes from like, you're saying one thing, but I'm feeling another. And not everybody can reflect that to you. So it's powerful when somebody does. What does it mean to be really open to feedback? And I, it was fascinating. We went around the room at one point as an opening and the moderator, the facilitator asked, how would you rate yourself from one to five on giving feedback and receiving feedback? And most people are better at one than the other. Like very few people in the middle, very few people feel they're good at both, right? So there's some learning just there, mm -hmm. right? Are you someone who, for whom it's easy to give feedback or is it easier to receive feedback? And where is the potential resistance there? Right. And as an entrepreneur, you know, if you don't know which one is easier for you, because they're both going to be liabilities as a CEO or a founder, if you aren't aware of which one you're good at or bad at. Right. There's strengths and weaknesses with both. So mm -hmm. uh, it was just really fascinating to see folks kind of own where they are in terms of being able to give and receive feedback and what's holding them back from that. Right. Diving a little further into that concept, you decide that you would like feedback from your employees, from your team, mm -hmm. and the team gives feedback and you do receive it very well. However, you digest it, you organize it, and you decide that you're not going to actuate the feedback that one of your team members gave, mm -hmm. although you did receive it and you did, mm -hmm. you very honestly listen and, and took it to heart, but you chose not to act on it. Yeah. That can cause such a rift oh, yeah. in any relationship, but especially in a professional relationship. Do you have any advice for the next step in that process? Yeah, I do actually. So I went to a workshop as a, it was a conscious leadership workshop and some of the authors of a, a book I really enjoy, The 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership, were facilitating this workshop. And we talked a little bit about feedback. And when it came up, this facilitator said, there's a difference between when somebody gives you feedback, asking yourself, is this true about me? Versus a stance or a mindset of asking yourself, how is this true of me? In other words, if I assume you gave me that feedback and that data comes from somewhere, then can I take it in and look for evidence that supports your feedback about me? 
Mm-hmm. Right. And if I can't find it, then to come back to you and say, I checked. I care about the feedback you gave me. I don't know where that evidence or that feedback comes from. Can you help me find it? Right. That's what curiosity in its deepest sense looks like. Yeah. I don't know that that gets to, like, if you do that process and you don't make a change, then I think it's a conversation around what are clean agreements? What does clarity in your relationship look like? Where are you in or out of integrity with the relationship that you have? Like, that's a conversation you can have. Is there a request that that person is making? Because I don't see feedback as a, please do this. That might be a request that comes after feedback. Mm -hmm. Feedback, though, is the facts, stories, emotions around what happened for that person. This is my experience of you. It's a gift back to you, and I am not attached to it unless I make a request. And I'm doing it because I want you to grow. I want you to be your best. Or there's a need that I have. But those can be a little different, right? The need that I have or the request that I'm making from you, that's optional at the end of feedback, in my opinion. Yeah. Does that make sense? In in the most altruistic form. Yeah. You know, because I think more often than not, when, you know, someone has the floor for feedback, it's very much mixed with an expectation of change. Mm. Right? Yeah. You know? I wonder in that statement, like if there is an ask about getting... Get, is there a request you have for me? Right, I, I hear your experience. I'd like to, you know, bring that to another conversation. Do you have a request for me? And a clean agreement is, you know, I'm defining it under the conscious leadership terms, which I like. Who does what by when? Right, because when we're not clean about what we agree with each other, that's when drama can unfold as a result. Yeah, that's been a powerful insight for us. And if I'm upset about something, maybe I can go back to a place where we didn't have a clean agreement and make one. Mm -hmm. So those to me are tools to just get a lot clearer about our relationship and have uh, conversations about them. You alluded to something that is always in the background with these conversations, right? I think I'm surrounded by very thoughtful and conscientious and loving, caring people And I feel very privileged by that. I've also created an environment in my life where that's what I'm surrounded by. It's not what everybody is surrounded by. Yeah. And so that psychological safety to feel like you can do that may not be there. And that's okay. I think taking care of yourself first is is important. But I think as a leader, right, if you're an entrepreneur and you are the person at the helm of that company, it's your job to hold that psychological safety as very important for your group where they can, you can be candid and people can be candid with you. Are there two sides of candor? Right. And I think sometimes leaders, especially big, visionary, powerful, influential people can miss the second part of candor. People for whom others can have candor with you. Yeah. I know that was a huge shift for me. Like, oh, well, I'm I'm candid all the time. (laughs) Right. Because you speak your mind. I speak my mind, right? Right. I don't have a lot of withholds from people, but I tend to be confrontation seeking Mm -hmm. and I tend to be very direct and I can have a confrontational style and that gets me a lot of things as a leader, but there's some liabilities that as I become more aware of them, Mm -hmm. when I got more conscious about how I was showing up and how I was inviting people into a conversation, People were more candid with me, and I noticed the change. And I think any leader can have that on either side, whether you're better at giving feedback or receiving feedback, being candid with others versus people being candid with you. There's yeah. a growth edge for, I don't know, almost everybody I know. Right. You know, and otherwise we would have a, a new species of perfection, yeah. right? <laughs> you know? Can you imagine the, that the, conversation? The perfect human, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. It's 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 kind of hard to even to think about the amount of vulnerability you have to have as a, a leader of especially, you know, a team of five or, or 50 or 500 people to be able to lead them through vulnerability and through true symbiotic candor, right? Mm-hmm. Is that the, I guess that's the right way to, to I kind of like it. it. Yeah, I symbiotic like that candor. I'll use right? that. <laughs> You have such a, a wealth of uh, fantastic verbiage that you know that puts it Thank that you. puts these into place. I'm sure it's from years and years of working in these spaces. But Julie, it's really empowering to me as a a young business owner to hear from you the um, the ultimate importance of emotional growth and focus on your mentality 
in order to to be successful in anything in your life, um, especially in this world of startups, where it just seems that it's so easy to get drawn into the KPIs, you know, mm-hmm. the, the metrics, the growth sales. at any cost. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, you know, it's a you. I knew there was more to it, but coming into this conversation, you know, I thought that there would be a lot of tricks to the trade. It's like, well, if you just shift your sp- your marketing spending to Google AdWords, you're, <laughs> you're you know, you're good to go, right? You know, but it, it's not like that. You know, there's so much there's so much to it and it all boils down to companies are made of humans. Yeah. You know, despite yeah. despite the programs they create, you know, mm-hmm. a company is only as strong as the humans that that form it. Here's my trick of the trade. People over process, product or profit. People over process, product or profit. People are people first. Yeah. We are, like you mentioned, organizations full of people. Mm -hmm. And I think when you take care of them, they'll take care of you. Julie, thank you so much for your time. I feel like we could keep going. You know, we always get into some good conversations when we see each other. Thanks for having me, Seth. It's been such a pleasure. Yeah. I'll make sure to include all the ways to connect with Julie in the show notes. Is there anything that you'd like to say to the people before we we head off? I just want to say that I think this is a perpetual journey. You're never never arrived, but being open to or having a growth mindset around who you are as a leader and how you show up in the organization as a leader, regardless of title, I just think that's worthy work. And it's worthy work that excites me. And you know, if that's a conversation you ever want to have, I'm open to it. <laughs> Fantastic. Cool. I really, really appreciate your time. Absolutely. Bye bye. Cheers. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for listening to the Mind Mill podcast. If you loved this episode, check out some of the other Mind Mill episodes. They're all free and available at themindmill.com, as well as all major podcasting platforms. Also, please take a moment to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It's incredibly easy and really is the best way to support the show. Stay tuned for more Mind Mill episodes coming down the line. I'll keep them interesting for you. I promise. Take it easy.